Hi, I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week comes from viewer Johnny Twist about his Mexican ash. He notes that the tree has some issues that he first noticed in late spring and that continued to worsen over the next couple of months. From his photos, we can see that the small tree is surrounded by a vigorous rosemary bush that's definitely outcompeting its neighbors in the battle for precious garden real estate. Johnny indicated that he's been slowly hacking away at the rosemary bush and that he's treated the damaged leaves with neem oil and soap, but hasn't noticed any improvement. Well, this is without a doubt the year for splotchy leaves in central Texas. After so many years of drought with virtually no spring rains and temperatures going from 40 degrees to almost 90 overnight, microbes are definitely taking advantage of the situation. We've been inundated with these types of questions in the Extension Office, and having spent my first decade as an Extension agent in the arid western part of our state, where diseases are virtually non-existent, this year has definitely tested my mettle on diagnosing leaf spots. So I turned to my friend Paul Johnson with the Texas A&M Forest Service for advice. I noticed a bit of what appeared to be anthracnose in one of Johnny's photos, and Paul also pointed out some other areas where the leaf spots appeared to be a different fungus, Cylindrosporium. In any event, fungal leaf spots such as these don't really warrant any treatment with fungicides or other products. As Johnny noted, he'd already tried neem oil, a natural fungicide, but hadn't gotten any results. The tree will eventually drop those leaves, and when it does, simply clean up the leaf litter and toss it out to remove the source of inoculum. I would also suggest continuing to prune back the rosemary surrounding the tree, or even potentially removing it entirely. That would improve air circulation around the leaves of the tree, thus decreasing the possibility for future infection. Our plant this week is a sunflower, Helianthus annuus, a lovely annual that many people may not consider planting due to its simplicity, but a good one to consider. There are a multitude of different varieties to choose from, so pick a flower type, a size, and plant away. Or pick several. Sunflowers are very easy to start from seed and grow very quickly once they've sprouted. Because of this, it's uncommon to find them for sale as seedlings, so purchase seed packets and plant directly in the garden. Occasionally, sunflowers will form a double head, as this one did in viewer Nancy Donner's garden. Sunflowers don't need a lot of space in width, but many get very tall. Plant the seeds close together, 9 to 12 inches apart, and in full sun. The common sunflower is bright yellow and blooms from midsummer summer through early fall. You can plant the seeds anytime and they'll sprout, but if planted too late in the summer, the plants will die before they have a chance to produce blooms. Sunflowers are annuals, so you'll need to plant again each year, normally in late spring or early summer, once temperatures have reliably warmed into the 70s and days are bright and sunny. Not only do bees and butterflies love sunflowers, but songbirds do as well, as the seed heads are very nutritious and yummy. Sunflowers require very little water and reseed easily, so if you want to control where it grows in your garden, remove the flowers before seeds can drop. Our viewer picture comes from Rich Hartzell of his gorgeous bottle bus tree in Cibolo. Although it's not a native plant, Rich has never provided extra water after they were established. Not only are they evergreen for him, they bloom from spring through fall, attracting lots of hummingbirds and bees. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org ctg to send us your pictures, projects, and questions from your garden. Mm -hmm.